Right now, it is time to bring in Arthur Schwartz of the Food Maven. Arthur joins us on a Monday morning, and we talk food, all aspects of food, uh, with Arthur Schwartz. And let's welcome him in on this July 5th. Good morning, Arthur. Good morning. I have an aspect for you. Okay. Buttermilk. <laughs> buttermilk. <laughs> buttermilk. So I, I bought a quart of buttermilk to make a recipe that I clipped from the Times, uh, the New York Times. And, in fact, I did not make the recipe that was in the New York Times, but I used it as inspiration (laughs) 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 since I bought the milk already to make this recipe. I had to use it as inspiration. No, what inspired me about the recipe was making a salad dressing with a combination of more or less mashed up creamed feta cheese with buttermilk as the you know uh, the liquid part and and i just like the idea but the problem is when you buy a whole quart of buttermilk and you're not baking i do use buttermilk in baking and and i know that my my niece and nephew use it a lot because they make pancakes and waffles all the time with buttermilk um you know, if you're not doing that, what do you do with the rest of the buttermilk? So it is going to be a heat wave later this week, although today around here is beautiful. Um, and I know I'm not going to want to turn any heat on. And one of the things that I, I, I mentioned, sour cream, I think, a week or two ago, because, you know, in, in this hot weather, that's all I want to eat is something with sour cream, uh, 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 being of more or less Russian descent. Uh, it's in my DNA, I guess. Uh, I immediately go to the sour cream answer. Um, and with cucumbers and radishes and scallions, and I like it. So, uh, But buttermilk is, is a similar kind of product. It's a cultured milk product. Uh, in fact, it is not buttermilk anymore. Uh, the original buttermilk was in fact the the, the milk, the, or the, I should say, the milky substance that's left over after churning butter, and it's a thin product, and it, it, it is used for its own sake in Eastern Europe. However, in my lifetime, in any case, it's never been that, and I never knew where you could get that. Uh, I guess if you make your own butter, you can do it yourself. But what we call buttermilk is actually a anywhere from skim milk to whole milk product that has been cultured with the bacteria, just like yogurt is. It's a different bacteria, I believe. Sour cream, same thing. Uh, and I think I, I said I've been buying Organic Valley sour cream because it is nothing but cultured cream, whereas most of the commercial, the more mainstream brands, let's call it, uh, are made with some kind of thickener, gum or whatever. In any case, buttermilk is a pretty pure product. And uh, uh, in my grocery the other day, they only had whole milk buttermilk. And I usually buy low-fat or skim milk buttermilk, and I, but I bought this, and it is so delicious that I'm not going to let it go as an ingredient. I want it as a main <laughs> event. Um, it is thick, it is rich, it is not that sour, but sour enough, and I can easily have that instead of, um, you know, the cu- uh, instead of the sour cream uh, for cucumbers, radishes, scallions, and beets. Now, speaking of beets, uh, you can buy extremely good borscht in a jar. I don't know if you've ever bought it. I don't know if you like it. I grew up eating it. You know, you you end up, at my stage of life, liking the things that you liked when you were a boy. Yeah, I like borscht. And one of those things is is borscht. And, you know, my father would go through so much borscht in the summer. My mother only bought it in jars. And and maybe that's why I, I still like it, out of a jar. Um, I can still see my father standing by the open refrigerator drinking borscht out of the jar <laughs> but <laughs> in his underwear. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, I still love borscht out of the jar and mix it with... Uh, and in fact, my father never liked the actual beets. 
Uh, and, and if my mother served borscht at the table, she had to strain out the beets. But the beets themselves are delicious in, the, in sour cream, and buttermilk, and yogurt, even in Greek yogurt. You could thin out some Greek yogurt with the juices of the borscht, uh, you know, the borscht juices. I, you can make your own borscht easily enough, but who, who wants to? And you can buy it in a jar in the supermarket. And truthfully, because I've done it enough times to prove to myself that this is okay, it's as good as what I do myself. Um, the other one is the other summer thing that I would definitely put buttermilk into, um, or sour cream, is shav. You know what shav is? No. I don't know. No, you see, Hungarians didn't, use, didn't eat shav. Shav is what my grandmother also called, and is properly called in English, sour grass. And it's sorrel. And we, it, shav is a sorrel soup. It's not even a soup. It's just basically cooked, chopped sorrel. Um, and you eat the, the liquid that, you know, it cooks in, too. So it's, it's a yucky-looking green. And uh, I never liked the color, but my grandmother would uh, uh, beat sour cream or, I'm sure, buttermilk, too, into it and then serve it with a lot of stuff in it. So I, you know, the cucumber, the usual cucumber, scallion, even radishes. As a boy, I don't think I like radishes, but I did like the cucumbers, and I like the potato. Always like the potato. So that's another thing. Now, you can, as you hear the siren. I have, the, I'm sitting by an open window, <laughs> but only because today is like an early Sunday morning around here. It was not a the only sound out my window were the blue jays that lived back here. And it was funny because your bird uh, 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 sound show just <laughs> was talking about jays in Texas. Maybe somebody should come here and do the jays of Brooklyn. They sound the same. Could be related. Anyway, uh, I'm making a joke. <laughs> I want to get. I want to get to this dressing that I actually bought the, the buttermilk for. Um, and it was for a very elaborate salad of grilled corn and avocado with this feta dressing. So I, you know, I, I had, I'm not, I didn't have the corn. I didn't really want to eat the corn. But I thought, well, the rest of the salad I, I'd be happy with. And I'll, I'll put some, you know, and they actually do call for romaine lettuce. Uh, so we'll just leave out the corn. And I, I will sometime make this with the corn, because the dressing that I made, extracting it from this more elaborate recipe, was quite good. And I could see adding the other stuff to it. So what I did last night was four ounces of feta cheese. Um, you know, I don't know if you have to use the word cheese after feta. Huh. Feta should be enough. Like, you don't have to say, really, pita bread. Because pita means bread. Anyway, feta, four ounces of feta. <clears throat> they, mine came in a six-ounce package, so it was two-thirds of the package. Uh, believe me, I'll find use for the other two ounces. And uh, you, I mashed it as the recipe directed with my in a bowl. In a, actually, I had a nice wooden bowl uh, with the end of my whisk. And I kept mashing, mashing, stirring, mashing, until it was pretty well creamed. You know, it's feta. It's going to be a little crumbly. And then I beat in um, a third of a cup of buttermilk. This is rich whole milk buttermilk. I think skim milk buttermilk will do just as well because it's really the, it's a sour thinning ingredient. And then to that I added a uh, mm, half teaspoon of salt. Well, no, I didn't use any salt. A half teaspoon of pepper. I didn't use any salt because the feta is already salty, I figured. Um, the juice of a half a lemon and the grated zest of uh, half a lemon. It was a half of a large lemon. And something I wanted to do a side note on, a small clove, well, I used a large clove of garlic grated on my uh, uh, microplane otherwise known as a rasp. Now, this is a new direction in recipes. You never, ever 
until very recently, saw a uh, garlic being grated. But everybody has decided that they're, I think, that they're, well, actually, I have a microplane just for garlic. I should haul that out. I haven't used it. Uh, but now that I'm grating garlic. But what I did uh, find recently is I have a garlic grater that I bought in Puglia, in, in, in Italy, where we, and it was in the Salento, so it's in what we would call the stiletto heel of the boot, you know, the geographic um, of, uh, figure of Italy as a boot. So and they do, in fact, grate garlic. And, you know, you have to love garlic, or you want it to disappear into something. For instance, a cold dressing uh, like this. Uh, you know, if you put in minced garlic, you would run across a piece of, as, as, as much as you chop it fine, you would still run into a little bit of garlic here and there. If you grate it, you get the flavor. And by the way, the finer uh, you uh, break down garlic, meaning if you slice it, it's one flavor, if it holds another flavor, if it's minced, it's yet another flavor. The, the more you break it down, the more intense it is. So one clove of garlic uh, was plenty for this. I have to say, and if, it, if you make it ahead, use a small clove of garlic because it does get, the garlic does get more intense as it sits. And, um, that, and oh, and then what I felt was something I really had to use. I'm really into chives. So this recipe called for a quarter of a cup of sliced fresh chives. Now, when they say sliced, I'm hoping they mean, I know they mean very finely cut, very finely sliced. In fact, when I say cut, um, I learned from an old colleague of mine, Carol Brock, how to snip herbs. You know, it, 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 well, that was an old recipe um, direction, snipped herbs, and that meant use a scissor. And I still do sometimes use a scissor to snip my herbs. So that had a, it called for a quarter of a cup. I had a little, I, I would say I had a generous quarter of a cup, in just in my small bunch of chives, I, I, you know, I lived in Connecticut. In, in New England, chives grow like weeds, so I think everybody can go in the backyard practically and get some chives. And I really, I, I used to poo, poo chives because one, they were super duper expensive for a little tiny bit. Now I can buy nice bunches if I want for nothing, um, and they don't have a lot of flavor. That's why you need to use a lot. Chives as a garnish is as a, a Yiddish a Yiddishy friend of mine used to say, it's a garnished garnish. That means it's a nothing garnish, a garnished garnish. Um, you know, it's pretty. Uh, you can add some uh, chopped, finely chopped parsley to this too if you to have it on hand. I did not have it on hand, so I use this dressing: feta cheese, buttermilk, um, uh, lemon juice, lemon zest. Um, garlic and chives over sliced avocado and romaine lettuce, and it was really good. And uh, I'd like to say it could have been a meal, but it just was actually a salad that went with a good steak because it was the 4th of July. You know, I like chives uh, on, on a baked potato with sour cream. Yeah, who doesn't? I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, really, <laughs> that's that's uh, that's maybe more American than apple pie. By the way, <laughs> you can get apple pie in Italy. You cannot get a baked potato with sour cream and chives <laughs> in any Mediterranean country that I know. Maybe in England, you can. Maybe, maybe in, it, it could it could be sort of Brit. Maybe in any case, that's totally totally. Um, American, and I don't know, are you reading anything American today? Today? Uh, no, I'm, pr- I'm probably just going to have a salad. T- I, I had a, you know, I didn't know. Yesterday I just cut up a big head of iceberg lettuce, and I put some feta cheese and tomato and a little bit of onion in it, and that's what there I There you that, go, that, you could have used up my feta cheese. Yeah, that's what, that's what I ate yesterday. I had uh, two big salads like that. Just, well, one of the things, speaking of uh, uh, salads, is buttermilk. Now, I, I meant to do some research on this, but buttermilk is the base of many a recipe for ranch dressing. Now, with the re- what I wanted to do as research is where did it get the name ranch? I want to know whose ranch 
they use so much garlic and onion. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I grew up in the 50s and 60s, and there was no garlic and onion in America, unless you were Italian or, oh, you know. In any case, um, Spanish, Armenian. I'm trying to think of the cuisines where you can't live without garlic and onion. But um, the ranches were not places that I... And Reed Drummond wasn't born yet. You know, she she's the pioneer woman who lives on a ranch. I think it's in Oklahoma. And she even says she lives in the middle of nowhere. And, and, and I love how she sometimes talks about getting ingredients from wherever, from afar. Um, but, yeah, so ranch dressing is buttermilk with... could be You know what? It could be beaten together with mayonnaise. Sidebar on mayonnaise. I'm gonna. I just. I just did a taste test of Dukes and Hellman's. Not official. Just in my own kitchen by myself. But it, it, it's often you beat in mayonnaise into the buttermilk, and then you add a lot of chopped herbs, garlic, and if you want onion, I would use grated onion, and you know grated garlic is great for this. Um, unfortunately, if you go online. You're going to find recipes that call for garlic powder and, gar- and, and an onion powder. And maybe onion powder is not so bad. But I, if anything has garlic powder in it, I want to be in another room. Yeah. I, I, I can smell it and it nauseates me. So anyway, <coughs> that's ranch dressing. So um, there's a new butcher in my neighborhood. That's an unusual thing to say. There are no new butchers anywhere, it seems to me. Well, yes, there are. In Brooklyn, I can name at least three or four extremely high-end, extremely uh, specialty meat kind of butchers. You know, everything's free-range, grass-fed, um, all this kind of thing. You know, of course, it's hormone-free. But whatever. Um the new butcher, and I, what attracted me to go back to this new butcher was that when I went to peek in to see what it was all about, they had a lot of groceries, and I and they also sold chicken backs uh, for b- making broth, because unfortunately, not just people here where I live, but most people do not want to deal with chicken bones. They either want boneless thighs or boneless breasts. So in the end, the, the, they're accommodating them at this butcher, but then they've got to do something with the rest of the chicken, and, you know, smartly, they're selling them as soup bones. So I went back to buy, I bought six pounds of bones, and they were astonished that I would want that many, and I said, well, you know, if I'm going to make it, I might as well make a lot if I'm going to heat up my kitchen all afternoon and evening, actually. Um, so I went back to buy the, 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 the soup bones, and I noticed they also sold Duke's mayonnaise. I have been looking everywhere for Duke's mayonnaise because people swear by Duke's mayonnaise as much as they swear by Hellman's, which is what I swear by. Uh, I grew up in New York. The Hellman's is a New York mayonnaise. It was actually created on the Upper West Side, by, I forget his first name, Hellman, who owned a, uh, a delicatessen on the Upper West Side, uh, which his wife worked as well. And they made salads, and everybody loved their salads, and they told everybody, well, the secret to our salads is our mayonnaise, so why don't you buy our mayonnaise, too? And they sold, Hellman sold his mayonnaise out of a big jar at the deli, and then I forget what you know, uh, what year they put it in a jar, but certainly way before I was born. So Hellman's mayonnaise is the taste that I grew up with. And Duke's is the taste that anybody, I would say from Virginia on south, um, the deep south, we now call it the unvaccinated south. <laughs> um, yeah, that everybody from that part of America grew up with Duke's mayonnaise, which I have to say is a very fine product. Um, it has more egg than Hellman's, and so it is thicker. People say it's tangier. I didn't feel that at all. In fact, I made some tuna fish salad with Duke's, 
and it needed a shot of lemon juice because I felt the Dukes did not give it the zing I wanted. Uh, and uh, anyway, I, I, I used up the Dukes really fast, <laughs> <laughs> putting it into different things um, uh, because for its own sake, it was only okay. It's just not what the taste that I grew up with, and the taste that I think most people listening to this uh, uh, broadcast <laughs> grew up with. Although I guess we have listeners in the South, and if you love Dukes, I don't want to disparage Dukes because, as I said, it's a fun. by the way, I did read some uh, tasting, some you know, online magazine posted, whatever newspapers posted tastings of mayonnaise, and consistently, consistently. Um, what's the craft product? I don't know. I can't even think of its name. I hate it so much. I don't hate it so much, but it's like a Miracle Whip. Ugh. Miracle Whip, which is not truly mayonnaise, by the way. Um, I think, even think the jar says Miracle Whip salad dressing. Yeah. Miracle Whip came in consistently last. And Dukes and Hellman's duked it out, pardon the pun. Uh because it depends on what you grew up with, for sure. By the way, Hellman's is the West Coast taste also, except that in California, and I don't know about the Northwest, I think the Northwest as well, Oregon, Washington, it's called Best. Yep, that's exactly right. Best mayonnaise is Hellman, Hellman's mayonnaise in out West. Right, because it's Best Foods yeah. is the name of the umbrella company, is Best Foods. Now, I have to do a little research on, the, on Hellman's again, to find out uh, when it actually became best foods. Look, uh, Hel Hellman's you can buy anywhere, except, well, maybe even, I was going to say, except that our little chain of fancy supermarkets here in Brooklyn, which are called Union Market, which refuses to carry iceberg lettuce. That's how, you know, pretentious they are. Um, I have to see if they carry Hellman's. I, don't, I wouldn't go there to buy Hellman's because I'm sure it would be more expensive than in the regular supermarket. But, you know, sometimes I go there for convenience. And they have, and I must say, they do have good fish. So, uh, grated garlic, isn't that, is, that's new, right? You never saw grated garlic before? No, I've, I've you know what I, I do buy occasionally is garlic in a tube. Um, uh, uh, no, it, it really is good. You have to you have to use a very little bit of it though because it's it's overpowering. But if yeah. you want it, if you want it to disappear yeah. where people don't know it's in there, yeah. But grated garlic does it too. And if you own, see, sort of everybody owns a microplane now. You know the the basic one at the very least. Yeah. And they use it for cheese, which I don't like it for nearly as much as I like it for other things like a lemon zest, for instance. Uh, by the way, um, this is just catching up with, this is going to be an ongoing thing this summer. I am doing a survey of watermelon, as you might remember yes. from last week. And in my ongoing watermelon research, I do find that there are seedless watermelons that have good watermelon flavor. And like anything in nature, it varies from individual to individual. And I don't think I can make any blanket statements right now about seedless versus with seeds. I still have not found a watermelon truck. Uh, maybe it's now July 5th, so they should be coming up from the south. And there are these, you know, I think they're not farmers, but they're truckers who bring watermelons to Brooklyn and sell them off the back of a truck. So I'm waiting for one of those. I'm hoping that that's, like, full of flavor. Uh, but I, 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 I am swearing also by watermelon granita. If you are watching your sugar and carbs and calories, um, I have to say that watermelon pureed and frozen is uh, pretty satisfying. <laughs> pureed and frozen? Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, it, you, you chunk it up, especially if you have a seedless one. You know, it's easy. You just chunk it up, put it in the blender, and puree it. Um, you don't have to add anything. Uh, and you put it in a, whatever receptacle you want to put it in. could be a freezer tray. could be a bowl. Yeah. Um, also, how, the consistency you want. And you freeze it. Now, if you get it solid, the only way to eat it is scraping off the ice. But if you don't make it solid, um, you can spoon up these watermelon crystals. You can also, if you want to bother, 
um, you can stir this as it's freezing, and you'll get finer crystals. I always, whenever I do this, I, rem, I, I remember, and I, I haven't done it. I'm reminded of a story, Iris, my friend, who has been living in Rome now for 15 years, but started out her married and mother life in, in Sicily. Uh, she would say, oh, you know, you put the coffee, you put sweetened coffee in a bottle, and you put it in the freezer, and then sort of every half hour, an hour, hour and a half, you shake the bottle, and by the end of the day, um, you have this beautiful granita that you can pour out of the bottle. And I said, yeah, there's a lot of work. She said, what else is there to do in Sicily? <laughs> much busier. Now, I have to remind her of that story. Um, and by the way, so that's something I, I did for years, by the way, and in an American freezer, it freezes much more quickly than it did in a, in a rinky-dink Sicilian freezer. I was even amazed that she had a freezer in, where she lived in Sicily. But, yeah, but she did. So I have to remind her of that, because she has a better freezer now. She might want to try this <laughs> again, and it won't take all day. <laughs> And, you, you, you know, you, coffee, you probably want to make it sweetened coffee um, because it's a treat kind of thing. And, by the way, it works with lemon juice, too, uh, lemonade. You want to water down the lemon juice and uh, maybe sweeten it and put it in a bottle and freeze it and shake it and freeze it and shake it. Or, as I said, you can put it in a freezer tray and just stir it every as, – yeah, as it gets – in a, in a metal freezer tray, it'll freeze around the edges yeah. before it freezes in the middle. So what you do is you go around and you scrape off the edges into the middle, and you end up with this wonderful slush. Very, very refreshing on a 97-degree humid day. So like, so you try, so Which is, like the, and they are coming. What? That would be like a watermelon slush you had. And well, you know, yeah, I guess yeah. so. Slushy to me is a new word. <laughs> <laughs> Slu yeah, Slu granita and slushy are pretty much the same, same thing. thing. Yeah. And also, they can even in Italy, granita can go from artificially disgusting to pure and wonderful. <laughs> and my my favorite pure and wonderful was a never to be uh, 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 a, a never to be reproduced moment. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly where in Sicily, but it was mulberry granita, and the mulberry trees were right outside the granita stand. We were and we were sitting, facing the water. You know, it was one of those sky blue days everywhere, and we were eating mulberry granita, which was nothing but mulberry juice frozen. I mean, that's how sweet the mulberries were. I don't, I don't think they even added sugar. We have mulberries, uh, a little-known fact. We have mulberries growing all over uh, uh, Park Slope and Prospect Park. And some man on the street the other day was wondering, sort of out loud, what all the purple on the sidewalk was. And I said, well, if you look up, you'll see it's a mulberry tree. And he, he did, and, you know, it was sort of hidden because there was another tree next to it. But we, uh, this, this time, well, now it's over, but if you come in June, you'll see streets stained with um, mulberries. And also in the park, uh, knowing people sometimes put down a, a tarp underneath a mulberry tree and with a stick shake down the ripe mulberries because the ripe ones will fall right off. If you have to pick them off, they're not quite ripe. But, of course, so all the ripe ones fall off and they stay in the street. I think it's a nice sight myself. Some of my neighbors think it's really a uh, unsightly thing. and they, I don't know. I don't know. And there's no way to help it. Uh, nature. All right. So, anyway, under the mulberry tree. There we go. Isn't that a song or something? Yeah, absolutely. And they sell mulberries at, uh, at, uh, at a farm up here in Germantown. Uh, as oh, well. yeah. oh well, maybe I should come up and buy some more. <laughs> I, just, I missed them. I only ate a few off the tree. As I said, though, those the ones you have to pick off are not the ripest. Yeah, and I and I, I think you must have berries now. Yeah, there's the, the berry, berries. We're just getting into the berry season. Yep, absolutely. 
Yeah, berries. Mm, maybe we will come up. Uh-huh. All right. Anyway, have a great week. If you hear from me during the week, because we're going to come up. All right. Take care, Arthur. All right. Take care. Arthur Schwartz, the food maven, uh, this morning here on Robin Hood Radio and the Robin Hood Radio Network. Underwriting support for Arthur Schwartz, the food maven, John Andrews Restaurant on the Hillsdale Road in South Egremont, 413-528-3467, down the web, jarestaurant.com. Rubiner's Cheesemongers and Grocers on Main Street in Great Barrington, 413-528-0488, rubiner's.com. Hillsdale Home Chef, more information, 518-325-7000, hgshomechef.com. Rob-